Thanks, Ann. Uh, well, uh, so how are you guys doing so far at GreatConf? You like it? So he's here for the first time. Let's see some new hands. Excellent. This is the 10-year anniversary, and this is my ninth GreatConf. I sadly missed the first one, and I'm going to tell you that it's a lot of fun. And uh, so I would suspect that most of you are already familiar with a Spark. Who is new to Spark? Uh, no hands, see? That's what I expected. So that's, that's kind of good. Okay. So my name is Andres Almeray. Um, I come from Mexico, but I didn't fly so far away because I actually working and living in Switzerland. Uh, previously, my old employer, new employer coming up next Monday. And uh, I, I like to talk about Groovy and Java-based technologies all around the world. And I really, really enjoy coming back here at Copenhagen for GreatConf Europe. And uh, I won't worry you with any more details, but I really enjoy uh, working with open source. So I kind of contribute to both Apache and Eclipse. It's, it's a lot of work. And uh, I'm also a member of the JCP EC, which stands for the Executive Committee, which is the body that helps Java move forward. And we can do it if you can uh, supply information and feedback. So if you're interested in to drive the, uh, the future of JVM technologies, please talk to me. I'm interested in talking to you as well. All right. So it uh, has been customary in previous versions or previous editions of GreatConf, you might know that I'm also attached to the Gryphon framework. And one of the things that we do at GreatConf related to Gryphon is we make a release live on stage. So today I'm happy to, to announce that Gryphon 2.15.0 is released and I can prove that. I go online and go here and just click post. And now everybody that's on the mailing list knows that Griffin is available. We go on Twitter because it's not official if it's not on Twitter, right? And there we go. Boom. <laughs> New release. <laughs> Yay. So you may be wondering, uh, is anybody here a user of Griffin or likes to use JavaFX? Thank you, guys. I love you. Uh, so there are not that many new things added to this release. We, we remove as an additional dependency that we had uh, with Java 8. We added it to Cord. We fixed a few minor issues. We upgraded dependencies. Uh, we didn't upgrade to the latest Groovy 2.5 because it so happens there was a bug related to Spark. So you can use it in production if you want, but not the test cases that we have in our build. So I didn't want to rely on a snapshot release. This is the reason why we didn't upgrade. So if you're already happy user of Gryphon, then upgrade to this release shouldn't be much of a problem. All right, so that is the final announcement. And hold on a second. Uh, PowerPoint always does that. There we go. Uh, so as you may be aware, Spark is, is, a, is a project that has a long, long history. And uh, back in that date, uh, when Peter Niedewiese moved to a different employer, he decided to publish Spark 1.0. And uh, Spark has many, many nice features. Perhaps the one that I believe is the most useful one and is the one that is very, very difficult to copy for other JVM languages or only any other testing framework is the um, data tables feature, which you can use in many different ways. But we also have integration with Juice and Spring. I mean, they're kind of uh, favorite in the Java space. Tapestry, Unitils, and Grails, of course, uh, is fully compatible with JUnit4 extensions. And I believe the team is working to making sure that it's also compatible with JUnit5. Uh, it has its own custom mocking framework. It can mock Java classes, Groovy classes, and the mock support has been inspired by Mokito. In the past, both the authors of Mokito and Spock, so uh, Stefan and, uh, and Peter, used to work for the same company. So they share a lot of ideas. And of course, Spock is extensible. But you, you knew this already. So, this slide is probably nothing new to you. 
And here I can show many of the small features that I like about uh, Spock. Again, perhaps uh, data tables being the, the most useful one. This is how we can parameterize our test cases. The fact that we can use a string as method is also great. We can have uh, placeholders for our variables, uh, variables in that particular string. We can make it a multi-line string if you really want it. We can have single no args methods in book on our variables, or we can create new variables if we need uh, new variables, uh, new, uh, different values. And the fact that we can use uh, the groovy syntax, which is terse and concise and short, makes our life, I would say, our lives much easier because we just don't have to write so much code. Another interesting thing about Spark is the usage of mock and interactions. So what I have highlighted in red is how we can create a mock for a type called collaborator. You can pass the type as an argument to the mock call, or in this case, you can just leave it on the right side. And uh, the next thing that looks a little bit weird, uh, it's going here not written a single interaction in the Spark. See, most of you know this. So what we're doing here is just invoking a method once, and if that method, in this case, foo on the collaborator, is invoked, then we want to reply with some value, in this case, is the uh, string Spark. Okay, so based on this, there are some rules and how to make interactions. And interactions are, again, related to mocks, and this is very important because many of the new features that you will find in Spark are in one way or another related to mocks and interactions. So the first thing is cardinality. There are many ways that we can define how many times we want a certain interaction to be invoked. So the first one says, I want that particular method uh, to be invoked once. The second line says, I want it to invoke never, so not a single time. The other one is, what is that? That's a range. So we are saying that that particular method could be invoked once, twice, or three times. Any of those three values should be fine. Less or more, that's bad. Then the four line says one up to underscore. Underscore is a wildcard, which means it could be any number of times, but at least it has to be once. The other one says underscore up to three, which means it can be zero, one, two, and three. But it happens to be four or more, we are in problems. And finally, the, the last one says any number. We don't care specifically about one. So I guess we have the, uh, the, uh, the rules for cardinality set. Okay, so next we get into the target of the method. The target is the mock or the stop or the spy on which we're calling the method. So in this case, it's a subscriber. In the first in, uh, line, we're invoking a method on the subscriber once. On the second line, we're invoking the receive method on something. That something may be any mock if we have defined more than one mock or stop or a spy. So we don't care about the specific mock. We just care about that particular interaction to be invoked. Then the third line is on the mock or stop spy with name subscriber or identified by subscriber, we don't care about the method name, but we do care about the particular argument we're sending. So it could be receive, it could be send, it could be any method. The four line says we're going to match any method that matches that particular regular expression. In the case of receive, it does match. And the last line is, what's this receiver? It's a wildcard. What would be the method? It's also a wildcard. So this matches any mock with any method that takes a single argument that happens to be a string. All right. So finally, we go into the arguments. So all these methods are going to be invoked at least once invoke on the same target using the same method, but we, what we're change is changing is the number of arguments we can send. So the first one takes a simple string. The second line says, I can take any string as long as it is not the hello string. So we can send Groovy, Spock, or anything. But if we send hello, that will be a problem. The third one is no arguments. The fourth one is any single argument could be an integer, could be a map, could be a null, could be anything you want as long as it's something. The, the fifth line is the uh, spread operator plus a wildcard. That means any number of arguments 
with any types. The last one, the next one is you can send a single argument as long as it's not null. So again, it could be an integer, it could be a string, it could be a map. The last, the next one says wildcard as a string. So it could be a string with any contents as long as it's a string. And the last one, this is kind of known as a structural typing. What we have there is a closure and we want the argument that is going to be sent to that closure to match to that particular uh, behavior. In this case, it has to react to the size method and if it does react uh, in a positive way, that means it can be invoked, it has to return a, no a value that can be turned into an integer and that value has to be bigger than 3. If the thing that we pass there does not have a size method, we get a runtime exception. If the return of the size method happens to be a double, then that's going to be a problem or something else. So far so good? Okay, so those are the rules. So now you can answer, what does this thing mean? This is the most generic interaction that you can ever write, and you should never write something like this. This means how many times? Any times using an, an, uh, an arrange, right? So on which receiver? Any. Which with method? How many arguments? What do you return? Exactly. So this should match anything. And could be a problem. Yes? If can you use, a, instead of a range, can I use only an underscore? Yes, you can, but I wanted to show you that you can still use wildcards on both sides of the range. <laughs> yes. It, it doesn't throw. Uh, hmm. That is true. Okay, so this was a quick overview of the rules of interactions, and because we make use of interactions with mocks, and we would like to make use of mocks in other environments. So now let's go into Spock 1.1. Who's already using Spock 1.1? Okay, it's just half of you. Interesting. It was released almost uh, a little bit more than a year ago, and uh, besides the, uh, the usual dependency updates, upgrades to the latest versions of Groovy, and perhaps it was uh, something else with JUnit and the other Grails and other support, they added the following thing. Um, are you aware of the concept of soft assertions? Who uses assert J? Interesting, nobody uses assert J. Uh, Go testing? Google truth? Wow, so this is probably very new to you. The concept of self-assertions is this. You can have multiple assertions in a particular test, but you know, without using self-assertions, if the first assertion fails, what's going to happen with the second and the third? They will never get executed, right? The concept of self-assertions says, I'm going to execute all the assertions and collect any errors that happen. And once all the assertions have finished being executed, I will Create the, uh, this thing will create a report saying, well, everything is green, nothing failed, good, but out of the three assertions, the, the middle one failed, and the other two passed, so that's good. In the previous time, the first one is okay, the second one fails, what happens to the third one? Never gets executed. But in this case, it will get executed. So this is how you can do it with a Spock. You don't have to use a J or Google Truth or Jago testing. You can just use Groovy's. Google uh, group is true, and that's pretty much it. But you must use the verify all block. If you take out the verify all block, then these two assertions will be again plain. The first one failed, the second one, it's skip. So how about that? I think that's, that's an improvement, isn't it? How many of you use the at ignore uh, annotation? All right, it's just half of you. So when we annotate with add ignore, we want that particular test method to be a skipped. It doesn't matter how it's implemented or not. If it fails or not, it simply doesn't get executed. By the way, if I have five methods on my, spec uh, my specification and uh, I want the opposite, I want one particular ex uh, specification method or feature method to be invoked, but the other four to be ignored, what do we do? 
Ignore rest, exactly. That's an already annotation. So the one that is annotated, it gets executed, and the others get completely forgotten. That's pretty good. So what if I have some code in my production, uh, some, some behavior in my production code that is not quite yet ready? It's a, some kind of like a pending feature. But I already have a test case for it because I'm TDD. I write the test case first, it will fail, and then I write the production code. But I know that production is not yet ready. I don't want to delete that test because I know it's going to fail. So what do I do? Do I comment it out? Do I put at ignore? No. What I do is I add a notation called at pending feature because this one does the following. It will run the test case, the, test, the feature method, but it expects it to fail. If it succeeds, it actually fails the, the, the whole run because it should not pass. This particular example makes usage of data tables, again, my favorite feature. If all of the rows of the data table succeed, this test case will fail because it's supposed to be pending. But if one of them fails, for, for example, the last row that I have, then this, because this thing is annotated with pending feature, the, the whole test method will be skipped and everything will be fine. What if I put an enoch rest here? If you only one one row, and the, I don't think it's possible to mix ignore rest with a data table. Say that you have five rows and you just want one particular of them. I think that what you can do is comment out the other lines. If it's a data table, if it's not a data table, if it's, uh, uh, if it's variables with the append and list, then not, not so easy. That's, that's why data tables may be better. Okay, uh, speaking of data tables, uh, sometimes you will have duplicate values in your table, or you may want to have a relationship between one value and the other. So in this case, we had the values 2 and 2 duplicated. Is there a way that we can remove this duplication? We could use constants, we could use a shared uh, field, or we can use this feature available in Spock 1.1, which is columns on the left side, yeah, that's the left, uh, can refer to values defined previously. So let's see, we have the column number one with all duplicated values, okay, well, I don't care about that, but notice the second row of num2. It's making a reference to the first column, num1. And notice the result on the third row is making a reference to the two previous columns. I know this is kind of a contrived example because I'm testing the same thing that I'm providing the value, the same is a sum, unless we're doing some metaprogramming tricks. But this showcases that you can refer to values that have been previously defined. So that's pretty good. And in case that you didn't know, it's, it's a matter of mm, source convention, if you will, that we can separate the inputs from the outputs or the expected results using a double vertical bar. It's the same thing if you use a single one or you separate everything with double bars. All right. So remember that I was talking about mocks, and I suppose how many of you use a spring in some way or another? Who uses Grails? You're using a Spring Boot anyway, if you have moved to a Spring Tree. Uh, same in Grace 3, if that is the case. So, uh, Spring has very good support for mocking if it's coming from Mokito, but because this is the case of a Spark, we can use mocks in a detached way. Now, you probably have created mocks in the usual way, which is using the mock method inside the specification. That means the mock is already attached to your specification. Everything works fine. But if you need to create the mock outside of the specification, for example, inside the application context, which is part of the uh, dependency injection mechanism for Spring, you somehow had to reattach that mock into the specification. Because otherwise, all your interactions will be non-existent. So how do we do this? Uh, Spock 1.1 allows you to use either detached mock factory or Spock mock factory bin inside a configuration object. So you can do things like this. Say you have a, a configuration class that should have been annotated with add configuration. 
uh, create an instance of detach mock factory and use it to create mocks, stops, and spikes for the particular type that you want. <coughs> the other way that you can do this is by specifically creating an instance of Spock mock factory being supplying the type. So once you do this, you can do add inject on a specification and uh, once you have a reference to that particular thing that you know for a fact that it's a mock, stop, or a spy, you can register your, your expectations, your interactions, and then just be merry. So that's one thing. And this is, kind of, this is the, the final list of things that were added to uh, Spock 1.1 thing in the, uh, the, the grand scale. Again, everything else was just minor bug fixes. Spock 1.2. Funny thing. I expected this to be released already, but it's not. It's still in the snapshot. So uh, I don't know if they publish on the snapshot releases to uh, Maven Central, but or you can use Jetpack IO. If you go to a Spark's um, GitHub web page or GitHub repository, actually, there are a series of instructions. That can tell you that will tell you how you can make use of the latest version of a Spark without having to rely on Maven Central. So the things that they added, they again change how we can use mocks because the Spring Boot has a feature called Mock Bin, which will create mocks using Mockito out of the box, put them in the application context, and inject them whenever they're ready and whenever they need it. So Spark copied this feature and added two annotations. One of them is called Spring Bean, which is used to create mocks and stops, and this is called Spring Spy, which is only used to create spies. Well, how do we make use of this? Well, we have our regular specification. Notice that it uses an annotation for a Spring, so that's a, uh, that was, this will set up the application context for you. And we have two services, two beans actually, annotated with a spring bean. This will be mocks. The, the first one is a mock and the other one is a stop. So this is how we are setting up our collaborators and then just making usages or these mocks is as simple as this. Just as you would do with any other mock. The advantage now is that these things will be coming uh, from the uh, application context. If you are not a Spring user, you're probably aware of Juice. Who uses Juice for production? Yes. And uh, we can have something similar for Juice. There's also a detached mock factory. And uh, I want to show you first an example of something that is not a Spark. There is a project out there called Yukito, which is a combination of JUnit, JUnit 4, uh, Juice, and Mokito. Uh, the authors, uh, it's a, a French company, they thought it was funny to call it Yukito because it sounds like what's up? Uh, martial arts. And uh, basically what you can do is you do dependency injection on a test case. Uh, that particular type that we see there as an argument on the test method, hello service, is going to be a mock created by the dependency injection container. So if there are more than one types, there's more than one type that depends on hello service, the collaborator, which happens to be a mock, will be injected to all other types. So all is handled by the dependency injection container. And this thing works. Can we have something like that for juice? Yes, we can. Here is. Uh, the Spark juice module has an annotation called use modules, which I didn't add it here in Jukito, but there is also a notation called use models in Jukito. It's different package, of course, where I can, I, I will show you in a moment what is the test module, but the usage is this. We can have dependency injection on, on our specification and then use the mock as it is. So we expect the hello service instance to be a mock or a stop something supplied by uh, the mocking framework. Our Feature test, uh, feature method looks pretty trivial. And the question that you'll be having in your mind perhaps is how does the test module look like? Now, unfortunately, compared to Jukito, 
The way that you can set up your bindings for a Spock and this module is a little bit more verbose. We had to do things by hand. That is, we had to explicitly create an instance of the detached mob factory. And in the, uh, we can have many bind methods. In the case of my, this particular test case, app module is one of my own classes, the class that I'm testing. But this extends from the default abstract module class from Juice, which has a single method called bind that pass binder. And what this method is doing is binding that type, hello service, to the mock that we have created using the mock factory. So it's a little bit more verbose, but it provides exactly what you need. All right. If you are not using a spring, and if you are not using juice, but you still want or need to create mocks in a way that is not uh, directly related to the specification, you still need to attach them back again. You can do this by using an annotation called auto-attach. Actually, the annotation auto-attach was inspiration to what I just showed for juice. Here's an example. You can create a mock which is, is per se is part of the specification, but it's a sort of a feature method. So it will not be attached automatically unless we add that annotation auto attach. So now you can create mocks from anywhere you want to. As long as you have a reference to it, you attach them, and there you're good to go. This feature was inspired by the work done by, by Vladimir, which is here in the conference, although he's not here right now. Uh, but, uh, I mean, if it weren't because of the work of the community, we wouldn't be having these really nice toys to play with. All right. Um, here's another uh, interesting feature, which is called at retry. Ha anybody has made use of at retry? Okay, so you guys, oh, here's Vladimir. Why did you say anything? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> mm. So what at retry does, is rerun your feature method until it passes, or it counts down to a certain number that you can configure. So, of course, this test is, looks silly because we know that it's always going to be false, true, true. So the first check is going to fail no matter what. But if you happen to have some data-driven test that you're talking to the network or a database, and the first try it fails, you don't want to have your test case completely fail. So you want it to retry it again and again and again until a certain point in time to say, okay, enough is enough. This thing is not working. Maybe I have to look at something. When you use the retry feature, it will tell you in the report how many times it retried and in which iteration it succeeded. So in this way, you can tell that, okay, something is not going on. Perhaps I need to make a bigger timeout if, it is your, time, if your test case is time dependent or maybe something else that is making your test fail in a couple of times. One more thing that we can do about mocks is called additional interfaces. So when you mock a type, you either supply the type or you give it as part of the, of the variable type definition. But what if you want to mock a type with additional behavior? In this case, we are mocking a list, but we also want that list or that mock to have the behavior of Closable, because lists are not closable by default, but we can make our mock so. So what this thing is doing is create a stop of type list, but also closable, and we do two checks. The stop is an instance of list, yes, and the stop is also an instance of closable. Now this is working for uh, Java stop. You can do it for mocks. You can do it for groovy stops. You can do it for groovy mocks as well. So. That works pretty good. All right. And I'm afraid to say this is all that I have for Spock. What is new coming in 1.2? There are not that many new features being added, but there are a few more things that I can talk about Spock. Hopefully, you have heard of Spock reports. Who is using already Spock reports? Only a few hands. I guarantee you that after this talk, all of you are going to use the Spock reports. Let me show you why. Uh, this is one of the reports I get. I mean, it's not that difficult, not that different to what we have with the, uh, well, it looks a little bit like JUnit in the past, not like the, uh, the other reports that we have. 
So what this thing is telling me it has the, the, the total number of test cases and how many future methods per specification, how much time. Eh, not that different to what we have. This is a developer-friendly report. One of my test uh, my feature methods looks like this. And you will notice there is a lot of green, and the green means I have a lot of strings. And many of those strings are arguments to the labels or the blocks that we use in a Spark. So you can use given, when, then, and clean up, set up, and where. And any of these blocks accept a string as additional argument. Usually, this string gets discarded. Nobody makes use of that, except the Spark reports. Because once you run a test case like this one, look at the type of report that get generated by Spark reports. And it can also, uh, so I, does it generate? No. Yeah. Notice that I'm using an underscore uh, uh, backslash in the, um, uh, in the dollar sign for input. If I were not to do that, I will get the actual value there because it turns out to be a groovy string. Okay, but in this case, I really want to see the actual text. So a Spock report gives me developer-friendly reports that everybody knows and that everybody likes because those are the numbers that we care as developers, but also can give us these developer-friendly, uh, also client or customer-friendly reports uh, that if we have supplied enough information in the messages, we got that text or representation. And you may be wondering, what if I make one of these test cases fail? What if I were to use, uh, change this thing? Well, this report will tell me uh, until which uh, block it was executed. And of course, it will display the power assert that will tell me exactly what went wrong. So we still have all the capabilities that we can find in the previous reports. So how about that? Is it that cool? Are you going to use a spoke reports after this talk? Sure thing. It's, it's easy to configure. Uh, let me show you a um, project that I have here. Uh, let's, it's great, of course, because it's a Groovy conference. Um, here's the dependency. It's called Spock Reports. I decided to make it uh, transitive false so that it doesn't pull its own version of Spock instead of using multiple screws. Just do that. Okay, once you have that, uh, we can go into uh, command line. And uh, oh, let's create a new one. Let's make this bigger. Uh, I have this in this particular repository. Uh, this is the hello PMBC. We can do a clean, so nothing on my sleeves. And I see, do a test. I'll expect some many test cases in this particular application to run. And at some point, uh, yeah, see, no hands. Woo, we can do that in JavaFX as well. This, by the way, is not a Gryphon application, but it should have been. We have some failures. Uh, that's kind of expected in retry, remember? Because we have false. Try four times and it fail. Uh, we can see the regular reports uh, here. Index. There we go. So these are the regular reports generated by my Gradle and Spark. So this one failed. Retry four times, fail, good. But what about the ones for Spock reports? Uh, that is in a different location. Build Spock reports, which you can custom customize, of course. Index. Hey, we have a failure. Actually, four features failures because of the retry example. We can go inside retry and says this. Actually, try four times. And it didn't work. And if I don't add any labels, then you will see the blocks as they are without any information. So let's go back into the controller spec, I believe it was. And we have this. So you still retain the previous reports, and you get additional reports. That's pretty cool. OK. Now, most of you are used to Spark, so you're quite happy using Spark, and you're quite happy using Groovy. I don't know about your teammates. Uh, was it easy to convince your teammates to use a Spark? 
but to change to a wacky dynamic language called Groovy. Everything is groovy, man. Right? So one of the problems that we face is not exactly that. The, uh, you have to learn a new language, which is it's easy. We know it. But rewriting all your test cases from JUnit into Spark to be idiomatic, that takes time. Well, not really. There is a tool called JUnit to Spark that uses regular expressions and a few things and a few heuristics in order to translate most of your code into Spark specifications. Uh, it does its best effort to make it happen, but some things might not work. The, you might have some really, really obscure legacy code being tested and that this thing will not be able to, to figure it out. But it's a, it's a good start because you don't have to start from zero. You don't start from scratch. You can have something that looks like a specification and then just move a few things around. I actually tested it a few times with some mixed results. Uh, I have the luxury of having a small team, so I, and I, I'm kind of like dictator, so I can dictate, yeah, we're going to use a Spark. I don't care. No, you're definitely going to use a Spark. So we're, we're quite happy, or at least I think we're happy. <laughs> um, nobody has added, uh, uh, put a horse head on my bed yet. But uh, if you can do this, if you can help your team migrate easily to Spark, well, JUnit to Spark can help you do most of the boring work. So, as I said, there are not that many new things added in, in Spark 1, but I hope that if you're making heavy usage of mocks and interactions, and uh, you depend on Spring and Juice, now you have more things, more tools at your disposal to make this work. You also have the Spark reports, and finally, migration. So everything that we saw today is open source, and uh, I, it's very easy for you to contribute to open source. So I was very, very glad to see most of you yesterday night at uh, the Hackergarten because every single team did a contribution. At the very least, they made one contribution. Some teams even made more than one contribution. And uh, it, it's easy to have a Hacker Garden here at, at GreatConf because everybody is really into trying to make things better. But if you do not have access to a Hacker Garden, and if you would like to contribute, the easiest way for you to contribute is if you spot something that is not working properly, if you spot something that is missing, then file a ticket. And that's it. You don't need to do anything more. Just supply uh, the list of information, the list of steps, environment, and engage in a conversation. But if you have the time, and you can participate in a hacker garden, or if you want to create your own hacker garden on your own locations, then that's the moment when you can supply test cases, probably Spock base, or supply a patch, and a new feature is a blog post, something else. That's how we engage in, in open source. But at the very least, file a ticket. And let me tell you, that is more than enough for everybody to start benefiting. Uh, that's pretty much what I have for you today. And I think we have like a little more than 15 minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions on a Spark, well, I'll be very happy to take them. Or if everybody wants to go see Marco Carducci some magic tricks out the other room, then we can also do that. So, so um, any questions? Magic tricks? <laughs> Sadly, I definitely I cannot do any magic tricks. Yes. Who uses TestNG? There's always one guy in the, in the, one person in the room. Uh, does anybody know what TestNG is? is? Kind of. So, you remember the time, these were the beautiful times where JUnit 3 said, oh, this is how we do tests, and we do not get updated for more than 10 years. Well, during that frozen time, TestNG came around and says, we want to do things better. Without, we want to do things faster. We want to do things using Java 5 because JUnit 3 was quite old. So TestNG added a lot, a lot of new features that eventually the JUnit team said, oh, that's kind of cool, that's interesting. Let's do JUnit 4. 
And test ng kind of like was relegated to is the better mousetrap, but everybody uses JUnit. So Spock is a little bit in the same area. It's a better mousetrap, but we can clearly see there are more advantages than just using annotations as test ng provided. Uh, so can we do something together with a Spock and test ng? Yes, you can. If you are running your Gradle, if your, your build is Gradle base, uh, you can specify on the, uh, the test task that you want to use either JUnit or TestNG as the base. And if you do this, then you can use uh, TestNG and Spock together. Now, one thing that I believe the Spock team is looking at is making sure that they can interact with JUnit 5. And if this is the case, again, I believe that TestNG is no longer relevant. Sadly, because it was a really nice piece of software, but given the updates in the recent times, clearly a Spark is a much better testing framework. So that's just me saying it. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> Anybody else? No? All right. So I hope that you continue enjoying the conference and give it a try to Spock, and definitely you are going to try Spock reboots. Thank you.